Okay. I decided to stay in the meeting, so I clicked continue. Good. I hope you all did too. Well, welcome to choosing a career, how to get started. I'm Dr. David Gerken. I'm faculty in the counseling department at Glendale Community College, and I teach career and personal development or CPD courses. And I meet individually with students to help them sort through career, academic and personal issues as they navigate their way through college. I'll be your presenter today, and my colleague, who you've been talking with already, Dr. Lynn Nitsi Bryzak, will be, she's also faculty in the counseling department, and she'll be your moderator today. She'll be working behind the scenes to make sure everything runs smoothly. So pay no attention to the woman behind the curtain. I'll share the PowerPoint slides by posting them in the chat at the end of the workshop. Actually, Dr. Bryzak will be posting them for me. But I encourage you to take notes because taking notes helps you remember and internalize what you're learning. If you want a copy of the slides, uh, be sure to stay till the end so you can download the slides before you leave. Also, there will be an evaluation of the workshop at the end, and I encourage all of you to complete it so we can improve future workshops. If you're here for extra credit in the evaluation, you'll also enter the information your professor or your program staff need to give you the extra credit. And we'll get this information to them as soon as possible. Let's start with looking at two people and their work situations. Jane is an advertising executive. She makes $150,000 a year. She has a great benefits package that actually includes six weeks of paid vacation per year. She works in a high rise office suite, has a beautiful corner office with a beautiful view of the mountains out of her third story window. John is a fast food cook. He makes $12 an hour working part-time. He actually has no benefits and no vacation. And he works over a hot grill all day staring at a wall, right about two feet in front of him. So of these two people, I want to ask you which of the two do you think has a job and which has a career? And I want you to write your answer in the chat. I'll allow about a minute or so for you to write. All you have to write is Jane or John. Which one do you think you would write? Jane has a career or Jane has a job. John has a career or John has a job. That's all I'm looking for. Just a, just a sentence or two. Dr. Bysak is going to monitor your results and tell me what you read. We have great participation. We have John has a job, Jane has the career, John job. Jane has a career, Jane career, John job. Jane career, Jane career, John job. We have unanimous um, agreement on this so far. Jane has a career, Jane career, John job, Jane career. Yeah, it looks like everybody, there's one person, no, Jane Career, John Job. Yep, thank you. Lots of participation and it is unanimous. Okay, so it looks like you all thought Jane had a career and John had a job. Here's some additional information to give you a clearer picture of what's really going on here. Jane hates her job. She works 60 hours per week and the high stress of the job has given her ulcers. She doesn't quite fit in with her coworkers, and sometimes she struggles to meet the minimum requirements of her field. Jane would gladly earn half as much money if she could do what she really dreams of, which is owning a small bed and breakfast in the country. John, on the other hand, loves his job. He enjoys the fast-paced environment, and he likes his coworkers. He's great at what he does, while the money and the hours and the benefits aren't great, he's able to pursue a degree in business while he works since he's working only part-time. His long-term goal is he wants to someday own a fast food franchise and earn big bucks in the field he enjoys, just like his boss, whom he respects. Now, who would you say is really on a career path and why? You don't need to answer that one in the chat. You can if you like, but... I'm just gonna move ahead and say that I think John's path reflects and rewards his values, his interests, his personality, and his skills. 
Jane's job is actually in conflict with who she really is and what she really wants out of her life. And that's what our participants are agreeing with you, Dr. Gerken. Great, awesome. John's on the career path. Great. Okay, so it's not always so obvious if you look from the outside. You know, you would right. You would assume you're making a lot of money, you've got good benefits, that you that would be a career. But a career, really, as we're going to learn as we go through this, is more about how it fits who you are. So the difference then between a job and a career. Got a couple of definitions here. A job is a series of tasks or activities that are performed within the scope of what we call work. So it's really just what you do. A career then, but it's a sequence of attitudes and behaviors associated with work that relate to our total life experience. So then a career is really who we are, it fits who we are. According to Donald's super self-concept theory of career development, when our values, interests, personality and skills, or what we like to call VIPs, when those are integrated within our job activities, then it is a career. And that's what John's situation illustrated for you. Okay, now you may have seen this old TV show called Mythbusters, went off the air, I think around 2018. So let's bust some career myths. Myth one, there is one and only one perfect career for every person. Actually, there are many careers that would be good for you, for any person. There are many different careers that would fit your values, your interests, your personality and skills, because of course, you are a very important person or a VIP. Myth two, I better make the right choice because I'll be in this career for the rest of my life. Wrong. Most people change careers three to five times or more in their lifetimes. So think of the career you choose now as your first career. And finally, myth three, choosing a career is quick and easy, but no, not true. Choosing a career is a process. It would be nice if you could come to see me and I could look into my crystal ball and say, you should be an engineer and you should be a teacher. But in reality, finding a career that's a good fit for you is a process. It involves learning about yourself and, and learning about the world of work and then finding a good match between the two. So now that you know that choosing a career is a process, let's discover where you are in this process. Dr. Bryzak is gonna bring up a poll and I want you to choose the statement on the poll that best describes where you are in the career process right now. You may think I have no idea right now, or maybe I have a few possible careers in mind, or I'm pretty sure what I want to do, or maybe you know the exact career you want. So of those four choices, when the poll comes up, I want you to choose the one that best fits where you are right now. And one of our participants said that, that they had already seen the poll and I see people have been answering the poll. Oh, so oh. I think I must have left that up in from our practice. So we've got um, quite a few people that have already answered. If yeah. anybody else wants to answer, feel free to, to do that. But actually we had 21 out of 21 voted. So Great. Okay. let's end the poll so that we can look at the results. I'm going to share the results. So we have three of you have said that you have no idea what you want to do. So great, you are in the right place. Eight of you, I have a few possible careers in mind. Excellent, you're also in a good place. Six of you, I'm pretty sure of what I want to do. And hopefully this will help confirm for you that you're in the right spot. And there are four of you that said you, you already know the exact career you want. So Glad you're here. You, you will probably also have a confirmation that you're doing what you want. So most of you though, about, uh, well, just a little bit more than half, aren't sure. Okay, thank you. Now um, you will need to click on the little red close box at the top of your poll if you want that to disappear from your screen. Looks like about half of you are so at least somewhat undecided on a career. And you're a good company because many college students are not sure of their career path. 
And I usually find that of the first year students who come to see me for career counseling individually at GCC, that really about 50% of those are pretty undecided. So this is matching with, with my experience. But those of you that even if you know the exact career, this career process, learning about this and these career assessments we're going to talk about, that could be helpful too. I've had people that have come to see me for career counseling or they've, they've done career work in one of my classes that I teach. And they've told me that, well, I, I was really sure coming in, but now that I've learned other information and I've done some research on the career I want, I've seen other possibilities from the assessments I've done, I think I'm gonna change my mind. So that does happen. Because as I said, there is not one perfect career for any one person. Now, maybe all of you that are very sure have done a lot of career research and you know exactly what you're doing, you made a really good informed decision and that's, that's wonderful. Even in that case, um, you're gonna probably find that you're gonna be re-careering at some point in your life because as I said earlier, most of us will have three to five careers or more over a lifetime. So this career process comes in handy throughout your lifetime as you're choosing new careers. Well, no matter what you, where you said you were in the poll, I think this process can help you, as I said, um, even though you're all starting at maybe somewhat different points. You may spend much of your life in the career that you choose so it's smart to make an informed choice and choose a career that's a good fit for you, that you're gonna find really satisfying. Also, it's hard to get there if you don't know where you're going. An informed career choice is gonna help motivate you to do the hard work, spend the time and effort and money that you need in college to get you to that career you want. And once you've made that career choice, you can plan your education to take you there. At GCC, that starts with a field of interest, a major, and a degree, and one or more certificates, maybe, as well. So as you're deciding on the college and university, you, you may transfer to in order to complete your degree. That's all part of this process of making educational plans. So once you've chosen a career and you're sure that's the one, then you can do all of the educational planning steps. We can help you get started on that process in, count, in the counseling department. Then we'll end up at some point referring you to the academic advisors who will help you with completing your educational and transfer plans. The acronym AIM, A-I-M, can help you remember the career process. It stands for assess, investigate, and match. The career process starts with the most important person in your life, you, yourself. The first step is to assess your values, interests, personality, and skills, and the careers that fit these aspects of you. Next, you'll investigate the careers that fit one or more of your VIPs and learn about the job duties, the pay, the job market, the education and training needed, and more. Finally, you'll consider all you've learned about the careers that match your VIPs and choose a career that's a good fit for you. Sounds easy, right? Well, not really so much. It's, it's, this is really just an overview I'm giving you today, and there's more to the process. We'll get into it more deeply as we go along. Remember, you just learned that the first step in the career process to, is to assess yourself. It all starts with you. So let's take an informal assessment. I want you to reflect on these questions. Dr. Prysag is opening the Padlet where you write your reflections. And here's what they are. From my previous work experience, what have I learned about myself? So as I'm reading these, I want you to start reflecting and then you'll begin to write about these. If I didn't have to work or go to school, how would I spend my day? How would I describe the inner qualities of the person I most admire? Not what they have, not the things they have, but their inner qualities. The Padlet link is posted in the chat. So if you click on that, that should open a new tab for you. And then you'll see the Padlet and the three questions Dr. Gherkin just read off. And that's where you can uh, write your answers. So you post your answers on Padlet below each of the three questions. 
We'll give you several minutes so you have time to answer all three of those questions. And if it helps, like for me, it helps me to write my answers on paper first. That's helpful for you. If not, just type them in as you think of them. Had the updated elsewhere. Hmm. Let me go back in because I don't see anybody writing yet. So I just want to make sure it's working for folks. Oh, there we go. So we have people that enjoy interacting and helping others. People, someone who's a good leader, someone who likes to be busy with their hands. So this is great that you know something about yourselves. You've really learned that and you are um, Hopefully then we'll take that into account as you engage in this career development process. So we'll invite you to answer the other questions as well. We have answers for the first question. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so if they didn't have to go to work or school today, here's somebody with uh, a like mind to me, exercising and adventuring. Somebody else would be watching cartoons and anime, hanging out with friends and drawing, spending the day baking, that's another one, visiting my nieces and nephews or mentoring at-risk youth, enjoy their hobbies. Um, lots more in that first question, patient, value, quality, somebody who hasn't had a job before, but work experience at school found that they'll take the easy way out, like to complete work fast and in a timely manner, like to lead and help people learn. This is great. We have a lot of people that are writing um, in that first one. Quite a few are, have written answers to the second one. You'd sleep, learn languages, watch shows, spend time with loved ones, spend time browsing social media. And then for that third question, how would I describe the inner qualities of the people I most admire? We have qualities listed, commitment and loyalty, driven and knowledgeable, patient and hardworking. They are inspiring, focused, let their skills do the talking for them. Hardworking, never give up productive, empathic, go the extra mile, selfless, tremendous understanding of the people around them. Another person that I admire understands art programs that I don't, they motivate me. Strong yet kind, good boundaries yet compassionate, passionate, hardworking, humble. This is wonderful. You have a really good sense of what you admire in others. A lot of you are very knowledgeable about yourselves. And then you know the things that you like, what you'd want to do on a day off. Great. Yes, great responses. You're showing a lot of personal insight and a lot of, uh, you know, the things you're writing about the inner qualities of the person you most admire. <clears throat> that kind of tells me what you aspire to be. And maybe you have some of these qualities already and you want to strengthen those. Maybe you want to acquire or learn some of those qualities for yourself. And that, that can be really helpful in looking at careers, learning more about yourself by reflecting on what have you learned already? What more would you like to learn? And the middle question about what would I do? How would I spend my day? And it really gets at your values, you know, because the things that we say we value may not necessarily be our true values. What our true values really are, are what we spend most of our time and energy on. So if you find yourself spending a lot of time helping others, then that's really a value for you. If you find yourself outdoors a lot in nature, then that's, that's a value for you. So that's why I put that second question. I think that's important to help you begin to get in touch with your values. Wonderful. So I think when you're, everyone's finished with the Padlet, then you may need to click on the tab that has the presentation, or for me, I'm having to click on the Zoom camera 
on my bottom toolbar to get back to the presentation. I don't hear you, Dr. Gerken. It's I will assume everyone's back. I was giving people a chance to get back. Oh, okay. It looks if you like cannot it. get back into Zoom, put say so in the chat and we can help you. Um, otherwise, I'll just move ahead. So now that you have uh, begun to reflect on your the um, your values and and your interests and so forth, um, to go a little deeper, you can. There are several different kinds of career assessments you can do, and all these assessments that we that I've listed here that we refer students to in our department. These are free of charge. We do have some more in-depth assessment that give you more detailed reports that are uh, that do have a, a small charge associated with them. But these three I'm giving you to get started on are free, free of charge assessments. I'm gonna post the slides in the chat at the end of the workshop, like I mentioned earlier. And so you'll have the links to these assessments on the screen. But the first one, uh, you'll learn your personality type and careers that fit your personality. With the second one, AZCIS, you can assess your values, interests, and skills and find careers that fit these aspects of yourself, as well as colleges that offer majors for these careers. And with my next move, you'll learn which of the six interest areas fit you best and get information about specific careers that fit your interests. So they all, between these three assessments, you're gonna really get at all the aspects we've talked about that your VIPs, your values, interests, personality, and skills. But let's take a look at my next move first. It's a good place to start. And that's with your interests. Next move, interest assessment is called the interest profiler. And it's a great place to start learning more about yourself and which careers fit your VIPs. In this case, as I said, your interests. Take the My Next Move Interest Profiler Assessment Start. You're going to press Start under Tell Us What You Like to Do, which you can see at the right-hand side of the screenshot on your slide. You'll be given instructions then on how to take the assessment. One important thing to remember is that this is not a pass-fail test. There are no right or wrong answers. You'll get the most helpful results if you answer as honestly as possible. And don't overthink your answers. Next, you'll answer 60 short questions by rating how much you enjoy doing certain activities or tasks. This is an accurate way of getting to your interest. And don't worry if you can't read everything on the screens. These are screenshots, so they're not that readable. Just giving you an idea of the steps. You can see you've done at the bottom, there's a little bar that tells you where you are. You've done the start step here and you're into the interest assessment step. Then you're gonna get into the results step after you've answered those 60 questions. The results will show you your areas of highest interest among six interest areas. In this example, the three areas of highest interest are enterprising, social, and conventional. I hope you can read that next to the word enterprising, it has a score of 33. And that above that, the E for enterprising on the bar graph is the tallest in the graph. Of it. So that shows you your tallest three, E, S, and C, which stand for enterprising, social, and conventional. So you'll see your own unique profile when you do this. You may notice that the next section of the interest profiler is job zones after results. So we're not gonna cover that in the interest of time. I'm not gonna show you that section, but what it does is it allows you to narrow down the list of careers that the program shows you by choosing the amount of education and training needed. I suggest you choose the highest level of job preparation as I did for this example. So you get the longest possible list of careers that fit your interest. You can always narrow down your list later. But the way this program works here is if you, if you know for sure, I'm, I'm never in my life ever plan on going beyond a bachelor's degree, you could stop it at four years of post-secondary education you wind up with a shorter list to look at. So next, you'll get a list of careers that fit your interests. 
On this screen, you can see the first six of 14 careers that fit the interest of the person who took the assessment. You will click on each career to learn about it, the job duties, how much does it pay, what education and training are required for this career, and more. Then you'll write down the careers you're interested in and even those you think you might be interested in. Remember, the program doesn't save your results. Now you've started your list of prospective careers that you'll bring to your first appointment with me, Dr. Brysak, or one of the other GCC counseling faculty. I hope, I hope you'll, you'll actually do the My Next Move assessment, bring us your list of prospective careers, and then we'll take it from there into the next steps of the process. You can find out more about these careers on other websites, and I've included some of the best career websites on the resources slide. Now, why do you need to go to these websites? Well, you don't need to, right? You could Google anything in the world, right, and get some information. The reason I'm suggesting these sites is because the information on Google, some of it's great, some of it maybe not so great. You don't always know the sources of where it's coming from. These sites I'm giving you come from the Federal Government Department of Labor, and we know that they're the most current, comprehensive, and valid source of career information. I'm gonna share the slides with you at the end so you'll have those resources. We've been talking about interest for a while, so now let's talk about values for a little bit. First part of your VIP is the B. I've listed 15 values here. You can see security, freedom, achievement, and so on. These are just some of the values to consider when choosing a career. In the chat, I want you to write down your top three values from this list, or you may have other values that you value more in the workplace, and you can list those as well. But list the top three to five that you are important to you in a career. You may find that, as I said, others that are not on this list, that's fine. You can list those as well. The values are just another piece in the puzzle of matching your VIPs to careers to find a good fit. So feel free to use the chat and we will, I will um, read those for Dr. Gherkin. So we have the conversation has started, relationships, family, facing challenges, relationships again, helping others, being productive, money, having fun, making a difference, achievement, fun, freedom, making a difference, helping others, making a difference, and having what I consider fun, family, compassion, taking risks, using my unique gifts, prestige. So it seems like a lot of achievement, a lot of making a difference, a lot of fun. Next, I'd say money probably shows up, relationships. I like that people are putting things that aren't on the list, like using my unique gifts. Mm -hmm. Being productive. Yeah, if anybody, we've, we've had a good, good participation so far, but if anybody else wants to write in, please do. I think we'll give another 30 seconds or so. Here's more religion, family, relationships, making a difference, taking risks. So relationships might be, might be winning out over achievement. Making a difference, achievement, family. All right. So like Dr. Gherkin said, we had most of you used the values listed on the slide, but it's great that some of you went beyond that and already have enough, enough self-awareness to um, include those values that are really important to you. Looks like we've, we've hit a lull in the chat, Dr. Gherkin. So if you want to okay. take it from here. Great, thank you. So what I was thinking about as I was hearing all those uh, values that you were listing is that first of all, I have a lot of those same values you were listing, which was interesting. And, um, and that there are a lot of you that value the same kinds of things, family, relationships, so forth. Um, 
But what about, and what I was thinking was, what about when you get into, when you're choosing a career or you get into a career and you find some of your values not being valued or even being challenged? And what if you have a career that allows you to have lots of time in your, with your family, which is a value for you, but money is also a value for you, at least a, a good lifestyle for your family, but that career doesn't pay enough money right? You're going to have some values that may be in odds with each other. So you're going to have to kind of balance, you know, ideally we could all find a career that meets all of our interests, all of our values, all of our personality aspects, all of our skills perfectly. But in reality, that's pretty rare. So we have to do some trade-offs, right? So maybe I'm willing to, I have good relationships in this job. It gives me time for my family but it pays a little less or has a little less prestige than I would like, right? So maybe that's the trade-off I'm willing to make, or maybe the opposite. It pays a lot of money, there's a lot of prestige, but I'm willing to sacrifice some time with my family. And maybe the relationships at work are not as good as I would like, those kind of things. So um, those are the tough choices we have to make when it comes to choosing a career and even moving from one career to another. That's one of the reasons that some people, that people often do move from one career to another. Sometimes it's the market, you know, your job gets downsized or phased out. Um, sometimes it's a strong tension between your values and what's expected in the workplace. And you just can't truly be yourself and truly be comfortable and stay in that job or that field. So you've got a re-career. And that's why I'm saying understanding yourself and understanding the career process is really important because you're going to more than likely find that you are going to be changing careers. I've had about at least five or six different careers in my life. How about you, Dr. Brysak? Well, what I, what I wanted to mention, though, when you were talking about the process, if I might make a comment first, is... Sure. I am thinking back to John and Jane at the beginning and that John's, one of his values, it sounds like from what Dr. Gergen told us about him is money, though at this stage of his career development process, he's not making a lot of money. He's making $12 an hour because that's part of the process to get him where he wants to go. So I think part of what we, Dr. Gergen is also pointing out is that that there is process and our, our values might be met at different levels at different points in the process. Yeah, I hear you. Really good point because with a lot of careers, once we get our college degree or and or certificate, we don't jump right into that being the CEO or being the uh, principal of the school or being the college president, right? Most of them have some sort of uh, requirement of experience which is why doing internships and um, volunteer experiences while you're in college, if possible, is really, really important because you start to get some of that experience. Even to get hired in an entry level job, sometimes you need experience. Um, but to get to that point in the career where you feel like this is where I belong and this is where I want to end up, that's usually a process that takes several years, three to five to even 10 years to get established in that career that you want. If you want um, one with prestige and money and some of those things, um, it often takes time. There are always exceptions. Sometimes in IT or engineering, you might get where you want to be and a good paying job um, as soon as you graduate. There are some of those, you want to be a nurse, you, your ultimate goal is an elementary school teacher. Sometimes you end up in that career pretty quickly after graduating, but there are others that have sort of a progression as Dr. Brysak was mentioning. Good point, and thank you. And you started to mention Dr. Gherkin, your career path, which is such an interesting path. And maybe this would be a place, if you think this might be a place to share a little bit more about that. Well, I could, I could spend probably a minute or two, but if I get into uh, too much detail, please stop me. Okay. <laughs> you know how it is when people talk about themselves, especially me, I don't know when to stop. Um, so I started out my first career really was 
being a musician. And I played in a band. If you saw me now, you wouldn't believe it, but I had long hair and uh, played in a rock band and had a lot of fun and made some pretty good money and traveled around the country. Um, but there was a lot about that lifestyle that didn't really fit my values, that tension I was talking about. I valued family and relationships and spirituality and religion and things like that. And sometimes I found those things at odds with the career that I chose. Uh, and so um, also one of my values is stability for myself and my family. And that was one of those jobs where you're self-employed and there's no benefits and you don't know when your next gig is. So that was at odds with that value. Um, so I got married young, had children young. So at that point I, I got into this Maricopa district. I've been there for so many years that I won't tell you because then you'll know I'm really old if I tell you how many years I've been in this district. But I started out in the district as a groundskeeper because at that point I hadn't been to college because after high school I went on the road with the band. So I got my associate degree in four years going half time, then my bachelor's degree in another two or three years and my master's degree in another year. And then I was able to start working in an office instead of out there mowing the grass. I was working in an office at a front desk, kind of like you would encounter if you came into our department, the counseling department. I was working in a tutoring center and I and ended up becoming a manager and a director, moving my way up. Like I said, that those stair steps you often take to get to where you want, where you want to be. But where I really wanted to be was a faculty member. Um, so I went back, I got a, my master's in counseling. And later, even 10 years later, I went back and got a PhD in education. So that's kind of uh, moving around and moving up in your careers, it can, can take a long time and it can <laughs> happen over a lifetime, sort of as it did with me. But anyway, that's enough of my story. But, and that's uh, a great example. And I think you can see some of the values that were consistent for Dr. Gherkin. He said that, that I think one of his values is learning and is being able to impact others. You can see that throughout all of that. Um, and sometimes he had to make amends or make changes to meet some of his other values. But, but thank you for sharing that story. I think it's illustrative. And, and one, of the, one of our participants asked about being able to, to change in their 30s, change career paths in their 30s. And you're an example of someone who has done that. My father is an example of that too. He was a pharmacist. And then when he was 35, decided he wanted to be a doctor instead and had four children and family to take care of. But, uh, but was able to make a change. And that was back when people didn't, didn't make those kinds of changes. But so thank you. Yes, you can make changes at any point in your life. Yeah, good point. I was uh, 29 before I took my first academic college class. And so those of you who are students who are just right out of high school and starting college, you'll think, wow, he was really old then. How old is he now? But um, yeah, I started at 29 and got my Associate's degree around 33, bachelor's around 35, 36. So yeah, your 30s, you can definitely do it. Oh, where do you go from here? If you complete the My Next Move interest assessment we just talked about and I just showed you, then you would write down your top interest in careers. Then you would research these careers on the Occupational Outlook Handbook, the OOH, or the ONET, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a minute. Take notes from those. Then make an appointment with me, Dr. Brysack, or any of the other counseling faculty members in our department by calling this phone number or emailing counseling at gccaz.edu, and they'll get you scheduled with one of us at the first available time. When you come to that first career appointment, bring your notes that you've taken from the assessment, my next move, and the notes from your career research on the OOH and the ONET. Um, I'm gonna show you a resources slide here in just a minute, and you're gonna see the links to those. So when you meet with one of us, we'll kind of guide you through the career process. 
And I think since I just told my story, this just came to mind. When I was 29 is when I, like, I took my first college class. I told you, well, one of those first classes was one that helps you decide on a career. And it's similar to classes that I teach now, ironically, and that Dr. Bryce Sack and our colleagues teach, CBD 150 and CPD 150 AC. Those are the classes. I'll show you a slide on those as well. But those are classes that help you decide on a career, at least part of the classes about that with CPD 150. And um, that's how I ended up working at the college in a tutoring center and eventually becoming a counseling faculty member because those were jobs that it said that would fit who I was, my VIPs. And I had never thought of doing those kinds of jobs before. At the time, I was a groundskeeper who had been a musician. And so these assessments can really open you up to things you haven't thought about before. But when you meet with us, our goal is going to help you navigate the process until you make an informed decision on a career. Some of you may have already decided, but not really done the career research. Some of you may have not even known how to start. And that's fine. Wherever you're at now, it's fine. But the goal is that you make an informed decision. Because if you take the time to do the assessments, meet with us, do the research, really think about it, write about it, reflect on it, you're going to make a good informed decision. And you're much more likely to end up in a job that really fits you and you feel comfortable in it. it you don't have that tension between the job and your values um, so much. And you're really interested in the career, you find it fulfilling. So that's what our goal is. And I hope that we can help you meet your goals. So first we'll go through the results of your My Next Move interest, interest Profiler. We'll help you decide if one of the suggested careers is a good fit for you. And we'll take you through the next steps of the process. If none of those careers are a good fit for you, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you some other options. Maybe we'll give you some other assessments to, and, and work, work through the process, okay? We want you to do ideally assessments, not only on your interests, but your values, your personality, your skills, so you get a, a broad picture of how these, what the career options are that would fit who you are. Then we're gonna help you narrow down your list of choices by looking at the pros and cons of each, okay? And let's take an example of, let's look at an example of that process of narrowing it down. After taking one or more of the career assessments, you're gonna narrow down your list of careers by evaluating each career against your VIPs and what you've learned about that career. This is how you find the best match between who you are and a career. In the example on this slide, elementary school teacher is a career that came up on one of this person's assessments. So let's look at how they did a self-rating. And you can do this. We can give you a worksheet. You can come up with that on your own, but considering your VIPs and what you learned through your research. So this person found that teaching fits their value of helping others, so they gave it a four. That it strongly fits their social interests, so they gave it a five. It fits the extroverted part of their personality, so they gave it a four. They gave skills a two because they already have a little skill in teaching. You know, maybe they worked as a teacher aid and so forth. And then that's, that's really based on the assessment, the first part, the VIPs. Then the next, the next part is based on what they learned through doing some research on the Occupational Outlook Handbook and the ONET. So um, from, that, from that research, they found that they liked the job duties a lot, so they gave it a five. They're willing to get the required degree and certification to teach, so they gave it a four. And while the pay isn't as much as they'd like, it's enough for their needs, so they gave it a four. And well, uh, actually they gave it a three, sorry. Finally, they've learned that the job market is projected to be good, and it's likely that there'll be many jobs available when they graduate, so they gave it a five. Then they totaled up all of those to, to get a 32, so that they can compare the self-ratings of this career with the ratings for other careers that came up on their career assessment results. Let's say their second, career that came up with social worker that they were interested in, okay? Then maybe a third one was, uh, a, maybe it was nursing, maybe it was something a little different. And then with those three, they compared, if they used this rating scale, um, they could get a, a good start on making a decision to narrow down from three 
or four, I know five, however many they were interested in out of that long list that came up on their assessments, then they can narrow it down to make a good informed choice. And that's something with that we'll discuss with you as counselors. And sometimes just talking it through with us is gonna help you as well. So the resources I promised, when you're ready to find out more about the careers on your list from my next move or look at other career options, use the OOH or the ONET. Both of these career websites are excellent. They're gonna include, they both include the career information you need to make an informed career choice, job duties, education, training, pay, hiring, outlook, all those things we've talked about. The OOH is really easy to navigate and it often includes photos and videos related to the career. So a lot of students like that one better. The ONET gives you a little bit more information, but it's in a more linear format. So you have to scroll through a long list of information. They're both excellent, as I said, and they both come from the same source, the database at the Department of Labor and the US federal government. Um, you may want to also consider taking a class at GCC that will help you through the career process. CBD150 is a three credit course that will take you through the process, as well as give you strategies to succeed in college, including time and stress management. CBD150AC is a one credit course that's strictly career. It's gonna guide you through exploring your VIPs, researching careers, and planning your educational pathways. Before we get into the uh, sharing the slides with you and doing the uh, evaluation, I wanted to briefly mention that we have three more workshops left in our series this semester. These are coming up. Uh, first one is test taking in the remote environment. And that's by Amy Torgerson. That is a great workshop. I've been in on that workshop. I highly recommend it. Test taking uh, remotely online is a little bit different and can be a little more difficult than in person. So she gives you some great tips on how to manage that. Building Optimism, Increasing Resilience by Sarah Padelford, another great workshop that I've been to. I go to my colleagues' workshops and sometimes I moderate, help them out a little bit in the background, but so I can speak to these personally. And, and this is another great, great workshop. Um, sometimes with, especially through this period of the pandemic, um, it really is helpful to think about and learn how can I be more optimistic and how can I bounce back from things? Uh, the Healthcare Literacy and COVID-19 contact, contact Tracing by Dr. James Wilson. Is, I've been in that workshop too, and I'd highly recommend that. Um, healthcare Literacy is really about understanding what your doctor is telling you and all the literature that you get, things you read and forms you sign. Um, it's, it's really complicated. And that kind of makes it, this workshop makes it more understandable and easier. And how they do contact tracing for COVID-19 is really important to know right now as well. So great information there. You can get all the details at the, at the, web, at the website on the bottom of this page, and we'll be sharing that with you on the slides in just a minute. That link is also gonna give you access to the recordings of the workshops that have already been done this semester and last semester. And this workshop, this will be there soon. Give, about, give us about a week to get the recording of this workshop posted here and on YouTube. If you have any questions about anything that we've covered or anything at all, please post them in the chat right now. While you're doing that, Dr. Brysak will be posting an evaluation of the workshop in the chat. I encourage you all to click on the link, complete that so we can, we can improve our future workshops. And if you're here for extra credit, in the evaluation, you'll also enter the information your professor or program staff need to give you the extra credit. So make sure you put it, there'll be a place to put in your professor's name or the name of the program that you're in honors or whatever it is. And we'll get that information to your professor or program. Dr. Breisak will also post the slides of the workshop in the chat. If you want them, you'll need to download them now before you leave the workshop. Okay, so thank you for attending the workshop. I hope, you'll, I hope I'm gonna talk to some of you soon to discuss the next steps in your career process. And let's see if there's any more questions, Dr. Gherkin. I've posted okay. the, the survey and, uh, and then I will now post the slides. And we had one or two questions we were able to answer during the workshop, but let's see if there's any more. I'll, I'll see if okay. we need them from the chat. Okay. 
Okay, so I believe I just posted a PDF of the slides as well. And any way to get the Myers-Briggs test. So would you like to respond to that, Dr. Gerken? Yeah, you can, um, the phone number and the, or the email address that we gave you on that slide for scheduling appointments. When you call or email, you can ask, how do I get the Myers-Briggs? And our staff will tell you the process for doing that. And it's a little different right now that we're still online. Um, we're gonna be back in person in a limited fashion starting the week of the 19th. There'll be one counselor on campus starting the week of the 19th. Well, that's so next it, week actually. That is next week, you're right. Okay. So if you wanna do it in person, um, you can come in starting the 19th through the end of the semester. And we're all hoping we're all back fully uh, in person in fall, but um, we'll see, we're hoping. Uh, but for now, you can do it either online or come in in person next week. And there is a there's a small fee for that that just covers our cost to print that out for you, um, which is great if we're doing this in person. And the fee I don't have that in front of me right now, but I believe it's about it's under twenty dollars, maybe about fifteen dollars. I think right around there. I think it's around fifteen or sixteen dollars. Yeah. Do not see the PDF posted. So it's it says choosing a career Zoom workshop. So I'm seeing that in your chat, in the chat. I might try another way of posting that in a minute, but if any others could to let us know if you are able to access that, that would be great. And then what we I've have done, another... I'm sorry, what I've done sometimes is just post it a second time and then sometimes they see it the second time. Okay, great. So, and okay, couple of that students. doesn't work. Um, I will put my email address in the chat in just a minute. And if you can't get it before you log on to the workshop, you can email me and I will send it to you as an attachment or a link in an email. I just put Dr. Rukin's address in there. And we did have another question and the others have been able to download it. So just great. try again, like Dr. Gurkin said. But here's a question from your career path of when you were getting your degrees, were you working full-time at work and how many classes were you taking a semester? Okay, I was working full-time. I had, a, as I said, I was married young, had two children young. And so um, I had a lot of responsibility at home. So I was work. I was going half-time. I was taking, I figured that I could do half-time. So I would take two classes at the community college when I started, six credits fall and spring, and then I would try to do another three to six if possible in the summer. And I met with an academic advisor at my college every semester before I enrolled to make sure I was taking the right classes so that, because I didn't have time to waste, I wanted to stay. I was starting late, right? I was super old, I was 29. I was almost ready to retire when I started. So, <laughs> uh, so I did, um, being a little facetious, so I, I took two classes per semester and at least three in the summer, and I charted it out, planned it with an advisor so that I could do it within four years. Everyone says that, that they call the associate degree a two-year degree. Well, it's not for most people. Most people, two and a half, three is probably the average. And some people that have to work full-time like me take four or even longer. So unfortunately, the reason some people take longer is because they don't do the career research up front and they change their major several times or they don't understand, they don't work with an advisor so they don't understand exactly what classes they need to take. So that's what I encourage you to do. And I, I think the way advising works now at Glendale, it, I think it's better than when I did advising. I think it makes it easier for you to make a plan and stay on track and have a pathway towards your associate degree and your bachelor's degree if you're gonna transfer because I had to also meet with my university advisor to the university I was going to transfer to ASU at the time um, every semester. And because my college at that time didn't have such a good agreement, a transfer agreement with the, with the university like Glendale now has. So I think it'll be easier for you, but you need to stay on top of it. So I was able to take two. Um, and then later I got into Ottawa University for my bachelor's and it was a more accelerated program designed for working adults so I could take 
few more classes and do that a little faster because they had four semesters a year instead of two, 12 weeks instead of 16. So I did everything I could to get a good degree and get a good, ed, good education and still do it as quickly as I could and have time for my family. So it's a hard balance to strike. I hope that answered your question. There are a couple of people who haven't um, who haven't been able to open it. So I am just reminding them to email Dr. Gherkin. We've put his email address in the chat. So to email him and he will get you um, a copy of the slides. And I hope you see my email address in the chat and that you'll copy it and email me. If you don't, you can, uh, you can search on the Glendale website, Glendale Community College website and search just my name or the counseling department, you should be able to find my email address. You can also, if you get the, um, you can also email counseling at gccaz.edu and they'll be able to contact me as well. And I did just repost it and okay. I have put my camera back on. So we are at two o'clock. Just want to thank everybody for your time and attention. And if there are further questions, then please email Dr. Gherkin and he will be happy to respond, I'm sure. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. Yes, thanks everybody. Bye for now. Let us know how we can help. Oh, and I'm gonna stop the recording now. Stop recording.